and this spirit of worship. I'm going to invite you to join me in this morning's prayer preparation, and we're going to pray this together with our hearts open. Oh God, in mystery and silence, you are present in our lives, bringing new life out of destruction, hope out of despair, and growth out of difficulty. We thank you that you do not leave us alone, but labor to make us whole. Help us to perceive your unseen hand in the unfolding of our lives and to attend to the gentle guidance of your spirit so that we may know the joy you seek to offer to us daily. Open our hearts now and always in your presence. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Amen. Can we give a hand for our praise team this morning? As always, what a beautiful, beautiful testimony that was for us today. Good morning, Christ Fellowship. God is good. And all the time. Amen. Amen. Well, I'm Pastor Ruben Sines for those of you that are here in-house and those of you watching online. And it is a joy to be back with you this Sunday. I just want to give another word of praise and thanks for Pastor Josh, uh, who delivered an amazingly challenging, yet um, very well done sermon last week on a very difficult text on the story of Bathsheba, and uh, however, we are not completely out from underneath that shadow within the story of David. So I, with a gracious heart and a loving heart, urge all of you in this very moment to take your imaginary buckle and buckle up. Um, Because today in this sermon and this message, as we continue on the story on the life of David, it does not get much better. If anything, it gets worse. These are one of those moments as a pastor where it's like, why did I choose this story? (laughs) This is not one of those where it's like, let's get up and get to church so we can hear about more unraveling in the life of David. So we can hear more about the disturbing and the hard And the long events that are transpiring and leading to a multitude of destructive and painful moments, not only within David's life, but within the lives of those around him. I just know all of you came to hear a sermon like that today. Praise God. Amen. Amen. Now, before we get into this story, I do want to urge you all to really hear this story. Listen to it. You will, when reading a story such as this, is because I'm going to encourage everybody to go home this week and to go back, because we're, we're going to be covering 2 Samuel chapter 12 through 14, and we're not going to read every verse uh, today, and I'm going to encourage all of you, if you will, go home and read that portion of the story graciously and with an open heart. To see not what is what we would consider obvious is that God is a God who punishes. Okay. So I want you all to hear today, and again I urge you, that yes, you will hear words of punishment. And that is what we will perhaps see. But do not allow it to take you to a place where you quickly draw conclusions to say, see, God is a God of vengeance. See, God is a God who is angry. See, God is a God who is mean and wants to see us destroyed. But rather, I hope that we come away from this story and recognize it is not so much that we are reading about a God who is angry, but we are reading about a God who is heartbroken. Heartbroken. And his response throughout this entire story is not a response against David himself, but it is against the sinful behavior that David has Chosen. 
that David has chosen. And what God is doing is expressing himself by illuminating, not allowing, because you see, look what God allowed, but rather illuminating the logical consequences that come out of such behavior. further placing the responsibility of one's actions on self. Now, I know all of us in here love some good accountability. Amen. Your first thing on your notes today, let this be clear. It is not punishment that God desires for us. Period. Amen? And I know all of us know people in our life who believe God punishes them for their missteps. Because that is an easier thing to blame and to choose over one's self-involvement in the difficulties they are facing. So it is not punishment that God desires for us. Rather, it is mercy and grace by His love that He desires most for us. This is who God is. I want that to be at the forefront of our minds and of our hearts as we hear this story today. Amen? So keep, keep, that, keep that in mind. And rather, again, so what God wants for us is mercy and grace. Well, how do we then fully in our lives receive such mercy and grace? Because let me tell you something. The mercy and the grace of God is continually upon us. It is never forsaking. It is never abandoning. It is always there. Because God loves us. Amen? But then what it also does for us, though, is that it requires for us to also take steps in the direction of such mercy and grace. And the way in which we do this in our lives and that of which God ultimately hopes to, again, with what we see in a story like this in David's life, illuminate for us is that he calls us to be people with then repentant hearts. So that's your second thing for today. We're going to get these first two out of the way. Right now, God calls us to be people with repentant hearts so that the very mercy and grace of God may be poured out over our lives fully. Repentant hearts allow us to better see and be in the mercy and grace of our good and awesome God. This is what God wants for us today. You can look at texts like in Exodus 34 6 and 7. This hymn of God's mercy, as it was written, it speaks of a mercy that is over us, yet it also talks about how the sin is, though, never necessarily forgotten, how sin becomes something that is generational due to the missteps and the sinful behavior of the people of God. But yet, however, while the punishment may be there, Right? This is how we'll take it. Like, see, but punishment is still on them, right? Because they are sinners. It is very clear to note for us that this punishment, as we perceive it, is very limited. Is very limited. And more than the punishment that we think we perceive or that's there, it is the mercy of God that is infinite. And that is always and always will be over anything that we perceive as punishment from God. It does not stand against the mercy and grace of God, is what I'm trying to tell us here today. The mercy and grace of God will always triumph in our lives. Because again, this is what He wants for us in our life. Last week, Pastor Josh talked about the story of David and Bathsheba. This affair that leads David into a very, very dark place. And we begin to see the unraveling of his life. As a result of this, and we learn about this in the 12th chapter of 2 Samuel, David does come to a place of repentance. right? And 
And it's in this place of repentance that Nathan tells him, you won't die. Okay? Your sins have been forgiven. Because of this repentant heart, mercy and grace was poured out over him. Yet, as part of his self-involvement and such sinful behavior, these kind of harsh, seemingly things begin to unravel. As we know, Bathsheba becomes pregnant. They lose the child. Now, we know that Bathsheba will become pregnant again and give birth to a son by the name of Solomon, which we'll talk about a little bit next week. The name Solomon means peace. And this is a, a, a quite an uh, important thing to note because it's a foretelling of what is to come. It, it's, it's a sign of hope in the midst of a hopeless situation. And so David is then cast back into this world of trying to find his way forward and away from these places where he had fallen, fallen ultimately into sin. The story then takes us into 2 Samuel chapter 13 and into 14. And 14 is going to be our primary focus for today. But what we're going to find that through these two chapters is a theme of generational behavior, sinful behavior against God's will and purpose, ultimately, for the people in this story and truthfully for all humanity. This is the story of Amnon and Absalom. And ultimately about Absalom's restoration. How many of us have heard this story? Some of us, yeah. If you haven't, it's okay. It's not a story you're going to go looking for in the Bible. Okay? And rightfully so. There's no sugarcoating a story like this one. It's impossible uh, to sugarcoat a story such as this. In 2 Samuel 13, we see David's oldest son, Amnon, commit a grievous, lust-filled, immoral, and an extremely displeasing act on his half-sister Tamar. Whom Tamar would become so ashamed and destroyed, it would cast her into deep hiding her entire life seemingly destroyed david comes to hear about this and he gets very angry but he chooses not to punish his oldest son because he loves him and we can say well this is what god would do right So David was doing what God would do. So it's justified then. And while, yes, mercy and grace is infinite, the sin remains unless there is repentance. Unless there is repentance. And Amnon never repents. So then begs the question, was David then justified for not taking action against Amnon? Was not love enough to forgive? The love of God can undo and restore unlimited and infinite amount of missteps within his creation has no limits so we as humanity have limits even our most deepest and purest forms of love cannot compare to the love of God fully. 
Now, for David to say, I love my son, could have also been an attempt or an excuse to avoid attention that would have been unwanted considering where he just came from. It could have also been an attempt for David to avoid any more bad press on his kingship. This is not something I want on my hands. And so I'm going to allow the love that I do have to be enough to dismiss these accusations against my oldest son. And so what we see is that Amnon gets away with it purely based on the status as the son of the king. Nepotism of the highest order. And ultimately, ignorance and shame plays a part. This part of the story for us today, church, is a reminder of a reality that many would rather choose to ignore or push aside. Things like this. Stories like this, similar experiences in our own lives, just cast it away. It's a sweep it under the rug. You got dirty clothes, put it under the bed, right? I was cleaning out my son's closet the other day, and they have these little trundle drawers under their, under their mattresses, and I didn't know what to do with it because my wife wasn't home. And so I'm just going to put them here. And I put it there, and I forgot about it. Three months later, my wife sends a text and is like, hey, what is this? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I, I was trying to do something good, right? But in the moment, you know, it's that easy. <laughs> to choose to put aside these things and to forget about them. Now, I want to take a little bit of a side trail here. We live in a time when people, right, because, again, I hope you go home and read this story. And what I hope it doesn't do for you in your life is you see, this is why I don't read the Old Testament. Okay? This is why when you hear people say, well, I'm a New Testament believer. Because I don't, what did I say, if you remember, pop quiz, the very first sermon of this series, I said, the God of the Old Testament is the same God of the New Testament. They are not two different gods. We understand how deeply poor and bad theology that is. To categorize God in two separate places and times in the history of creation, we don't do that. Not this, that's not how this works. So I'm a New Testament believer because of stories like this in the Old Testament. And again, I know this is not one of those feel-good sermons we want to hop out of bed to get to church to hear about. It's not a story that we want to, we want to pretend that's there even. It's one that we want to try to rather ignore more than anything. And then even more than that, we'll try to come up with arguments to say, well, it's stories like this where you have to take into account context. It doesn't apply to me today. But church, let me tell you something. That argument of context is a very weak argument. Yes, the lay of the land may look different. Yes, some of the laws may have changed. We no longer hand off of people who steal. Or an eye for an eye, per se. Culture's different, food's different, of course. But there is one thing that has not changed. People. People. We are broken and sinful. And it has been this way. Now I have hope on that little word there here in a minute. So further, this story for us illuminates our ability to neglect and put aside what is right 
ultimately leaving things, therefore, then undone. Even if it is at the cost of our own well-being and even more at the cost of the well-being of others. And David is going to learn that lesson. And David also teaches us that no one is exempt. Not even the mighty king. Too many people in our world have laid down as victims due to the unfinished work of those who were meant to be righteous. And the leaving of things undone has only furthered the separation within the body as it was meant to be one and the separation between us and God. Stories like this still happening today. And we cannot be ignorant to it. We cannot neglect it. And we surely cannot dismiss it. David allowed this behavior to become a standard. And unfortunately, it is a standard that is still held high today. A sinful standard rooted in behavior that is not of God. Plain and simple, it's not of God. And his lack of facing this negative situation, it spiraled and it multiplied further habits of sinful behavior, not just within himself but within those who were around him, especially those in whom he was meant to lead first, his own family, his own children. We come to learn that further in this chapter of chapter 13, Absalom, who has bided his time several years now waiting for his father to do something and not it not happening for what's happened to his sister he decides I'm going to take it into my own hands and so he creates this event that will allow Amnon to come into a same place as him and Amnon comes as if nothing has happened, ready to party and to break bread with his brother. It was in this event that Absalom uses it to his advantage and kills his brother. Kills his brother. Justice is served. This form of deceit and trickery uh, is familiar, is it not? I think his father did something similar with Uriah in a way. So you see, you see what I'm saying about the multiplication of these habits. So Absalom goes into hiding. He goes into hiding with his grandfather, who was also a neighboring king. And word gets back to David, and as you can imagine, David is distraught. But once again, David does nothing because the standard had already been set. It has now become a habit of his to just decide that when things come pressing up against that are completely away from the things of God and how things are supposed to be and how they are supposed to respond in such situations, because he's already neglected those types of moves as he should have in faith, it comes so easy now to say, you know what, I'll deal with it later or not deal with it at all. Therefore, leaving and continually leaving, that what originally was undone that perhaps was, I don't want to say doable, but could have much easier been able to be handled and addressed, is now at a point of almost no return. Another breaking point. And so again, Absalom goes into hiding. 
we far too often will approach situations when it is too late. So then we get into 2 Samuel chapter 14, all right? And, and the, the subtitle for this is Absalom Restored. And I don't, I don't quite agree with that title. It should almost be like in quotations, restored. You know, like a kind of but not really kind of feeling. So I mentioned, look, God, we are never too far gone for God. Amen. <laughs> God is infinite and his reach is further than we can ever imagine. He will come find us. No matter where we try to go hide, in the depths of the caves, in the depths of ourselves, God is coming because he wants to be with us as he wants us to be with him. He has no limits, but again, we do. God can let generations sin against him and come swooping in in one move, boom, Jesus, and restore. Because God can. It's not so easy for us. I'll get to it when I get to it. When our capacities, when we're trying to deal with family, work, faith, stressful situations, you name it. You start tallying up that list and you put that one thing that you need to go and round out and resolve and you decide, let me put it in item number seven and I'll get to it later. You know as well as I do, item seven will become item 100 in a matter of moments. How easy does damaging and destructive things develop in our life quicker than we could ever imagine? It doesn't take much. Negligence alone will create a far deeper chasm. Whether we had a shovel or not, than we could ever imagine. And David reminds us of this. That in our humanity, the damage does not take long to develop. David took five years to confront Absalom. Five years. And then you can ask, if you read that, that, the, the verses leading up to this in, in chapter 14, had it not been for people going on Absalom's behalf? Because they did. They tried kind of convincing David to do something that he didn't know he was going to be doing, but that essentially was going to lead him back to Absalom. Who knows how long David would have gone without confronting Absalom. It could have been another five years. It could have been never. How many of us have ever had people come in our life, you need to talk to your sister. You need to, you need to talk to your son. You, you need to talk to your friend. You, you need to talk to your spouse. How many of us have had to have those moments in order to do something that of which we did not want to do? Any show of hands on that one. And so David finds himself in this place where he is now faced with Absalom. And Absalom is like, I don't want to go either. Because he knows that what the punishment should be is obviously death. Right? Is obviously death. And in this time, if you want to get a contextual look, you did something wrong, usually death was the punishment. It was very black and white. <laughs> there, wasn't, there weren't a lot of options for your, for your punishment. Okay? And this is also where we kind of, we kind of get our understanding of how, of how sin works, right? The consequence of sin ultimately is, is death, right? And, and that's something we want to completely avoid. But thank God for God's mercy and grace that he gives us a way out of that, right? But for people in this time, they didn't have Jesus yet. And so he was life or death, period. And so Absalom knew, as soon as he stepped foot into that court, I know that's my father, and Absalom, well, maybe he'll have grace on me like he did for Amnon, but he wasn't the oldest, and that also mattered. He was the third. I'm the third, right? I don't know. I'm the third son, but, you know, it, 
he was the third son, so he knew that his status did not carry as much weight. He wasn't in a direct heir to this throne. And so he knew that I step foot into this court, I'm done. And so that's where we pick up. And then I'm going to read these verses. Verses 31 through 33 in chapter 14. So Joab went straight to Absalom's house and said to him, Why have your servants set my property on fire? And Absalom answered, Joab, look, I sent you a message. Come here so I could send you to the king to ask why I have returned from uh, Geshur. I would be better off if I were still there. But he didn't want to go. Please let me see the king's face now. If I'm guilty, then the king can kill me. So he's kind of just like, you know what? It's set in motion now. Might as well go and deal with it, right? Let's put an end to that of which is undone. So Joab went to the king and reported this to him. The king called for Absalom, and Absalom came to the king, and he bowed low out of respect, nose to the ground before the king. Then the king kissed Absalom. Awesome. Everything is better now. Everything has been restored. Absalom is restored, right? Everything is good. No. So, context, history. When you come before the king, a kiss is a form of respecting and recognizing you're coming forward. But unless the words are uttered, you are pardoned, there is no full pardon. Your guilt still remains. So what we see here is David giving a partial restoration to Absalom. A partial restoration to Absalom. Imagine if God was like that. I recognize you're there. I see you. But that's all I'm going to give you. I see you. This is what essentially David's done to Absalom. You're here. I see you. Thank you for bowing before your king, as you should. But the pardon never comes. That's why I say restored. And just on a side note, it is immediately following these events that Absalom will go and raise up a rebellion against his father. If full restoration was implemented, ain't no rebellion happening in the kingdom. And Absalom said he was the most handsome man in all the kingdom, and so he had a, a draw and a charm, and he was able to pull quite a large amount of people that ultimately would cast David out of his own kingdom and send him on the run again. Now you can say, that's on Absalom. But you can also say, what if David wouldn't have been so long to leave things undone the way he did? Today's story is about the impact of our actions when we leave negative situations undone in our lives. Now, it's not to condemn, okay? Because we are human. We don't have it all figured out. No matter the depth of our experience in life, we struggle, we fall, me, you, all of us. So it's not to condemn, but rather it's to help us recognize that of which we need most in situations such as this. And that is the mercy and the grace of God. Because without it, we will only continue to fall. If, if God wanted to uh, punish us he could. He could. Um, he could choose to leave it undone. Because he's God. And, and no one can hold it against him. And he could still be in existence. Because he doesn't rely on us for his own existence. God is God. With or without us. That's how 
amazing and powerful our God is. But God chooses not to do this. But rather, God, as I said, imagine if God was like that, the partialness. God does not work in partiality. God is about fullness. God is about wholeness. So this is why, instead of leaving things undone from generations of sinful behavior, that of which we find in the likes of David and his family, he rather decides to seal it, to seal that of what may be seen as undone by giving us Jesus. Praise God. Praise God. Amen? And so it is with that hope that I pray in the receiving of a story like this and reflecting on our lives and where we are today that we may make the faithful effort to seek out what is undone as to make it whole again. There is no real conclusion to today's sermon. There was no intent of that. And so today, though, what I would like to do and what I want to invite you all to do on your handouts, the very last thing there, that asks what in your life has been left undone. Our praise team is going to play a song of reflection. There's going to be no words on the screen, so... Don't look up. I'm going to invite everybody in this space this morning, the presence of God and the presence of His mercy and His grace over those with repentant hearts open to receive all that He wants to give to us. Even in the midst of our separation, even in the midst of our behavior that is more sinful than it is godly, to take a moment to reflect on situations, relationships with others or even with self, with God that you have left undone. And I want to invite you to write that today. To write that today. And as you write it, Remember those first two things. It is not punishment that God desires for us for the things that we left undone, but rather it is mercy and grace. Because it's by this mercy and grace that it will allow us to seek out that of which is undone in our lives. To be people with repentant hearts so that we can come forward and be made whole and full again. So I'm going to invite you, church, to respond in this way this day? What situations, relationships with others or with self have you left undone and are needing the mercy and grace of God over you and your life as to see what was broken become whole again? Church, let's pray. <clears throat> God, uh, we thank you. We thank you for your willingness to impart mercy and grace upon us. Even when we are far from deserving it, even though we, we should receive something that is not so good, that may feel or seem in our life, Yet you, you call us. You call us to a place where we may be able to bring all that we are, even in our transgressions, even in our, in our behaviors that are not solely and honoring and pleasing to you. And you give us the, the beautiful gift of repentance. To, to offer our hearts to you and to say, God, I know I have stumbled. I know I have fallen. 
And it is you now that I, I only seek. And it is through that, like, uh, the raging river, you, you come pouring out into our lives. And then through your power and your, your Holy Spirit, you begin to work in us to, to seal and to mend that of which is undone. With ourselves or with others. And dear God, you know that even in this moment, even when we want it to be an instant fix, it's not always like that. And so I pray that as we go forward from this place that we recognize that this is a journey. Like David is on this journey of constantly finding home and then on the run again. Finding home and then on the run again. Sometimes we feel like that. For some of us, we're there now. But let one thing be clear for us in our lives, in this day always, that you are still God. And you are still with us. Even in that of which is undone. You know our hearts today. Give us the strength that we need to go forth and to do that of which you have called us to do. So that we may, not only as individuals, but as a whole, be made whole with you, by you, and for you. We thank you for your word today. We thank you for the opportunity to worship. And we, we praise your name now and forevermore. In the great name of Jesus Christ and all of God's children say, amen. Amen.